On today's podcast, our guest is Kathleen Didone of Code 3 Records Artist Services. It was an interesting conversation. You know, this is a very, very interesting area that we want to be able to reveal to you guys is the whole element of artist services. This is all part of what we talk about with the revolution and the evolution, if you will, of artists taking accountability for their own careers. And we talked a lot about, you know, the services that they provide, the kinds of partnerships that you need. We talk about social media, identity identifying your audience, and a lot of other great pieces of information that I think you'll find interesting. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, Insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sat down with Kathleen Didone of Code 3 Records Artist Services to discuss the many ways independent artists need to market themselves today, including through the development of the right partnerships and collaborations, understanding social media, and much, much more. You don't want to miss it, but first... A word from our sponsor. Hey, Insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the A&R Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, Insiders. Today's guest on our featured interview is Kathleen Didone. She is the owner of a company called Code 3 Record Artist Services. Now, many of you may have heard that term over the years, artist services. What is it? It's essentially something that, easiest way to explain it, it takes the place of a record label. It's a company that you can hire to perform certain services for you, depending on what your individual needs are. And it was an interesting conversation. You know, we had a, a, a talk with her regarding, you know, what she does for her clients, what are the content needs that she has, like what does she need from you. Uh, Some of the more interesting things I thought, Eric, were like understanding the culture of the social media platforms that you choose to work in right. and finding the right collaborations and partnerships, you know, among some other stuff that uh, that we get into in this conversation. Yeah, and I thought it was unique in the sense that, you know, her company is based on doing artist services for independent artists, which is not something that usually happens. Normally, a lot of these uh, artist services companies like a BMG or uh, uh, what was the other one called? Oh, In Grooves. In Grooves, yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, or companies like that where they deal with acts that have already had established Established audiences and they may have been part of that major label system and they're now out on their own where they have enough of an audience that they can do something like this where it's much more beneficial they retain the ownership of their masters and they basically control their destiny so I thought it was a very interesting and unique kind of niche to be in with providing artist services for independent acts. Absolutely and it's also very timely in that so many artists today, the amount of independent artists you know, who own their own material who own their own masters is growing Growing substantially. I mean, it's it's grown something like 40% in the last year and a half alone. So this will be an interesting conversation. Absolutely. So with that, insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our featured interview with Kathleen Didone. Kathleen, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Great to be here. Thanks, guys. You know, I, I always like to begin uh, our conversations with with our guests by asking them a, a question about, a personal question about their professional lives, which is, do you remember when you knew that, you know, working in music was going to be your professional career path? Oh, yeah. You know, first time, like, I got into rock and roll. <laughs> okay. Teenager. <laughs> All right. And uh, just started managing bands. Well, well, can you can you tell us about that? I mean, it, 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 that that's not a natural path. I mean, how how did that occur? How did that passion or you know 
desire or interest or, or circumstance come about for you? Well, I'm not a musician, but I have really great organizational skills and I just wanted to be a part of it, be a part of like the whole music production scene. Okay. And I just enjoyed being around artists and music. So it's just a path I thought I should follow. Did you grow up with a lot of bands? No, just a love for music with my father and, you know, always listening to music and, you know, as a kid, like, you know, just quizzing me. <laughs> Who's this? Who's that? <laughs> uh, this is uh, Eric. Thank you so much for doing this, Kathleen. Um, let bet. me ask you, from your perspective, is this a healthy period for our independent music artists who, you know, want to build a career for themselves? And, and if so, why? Oh, absolutely. This is the time for indie artists, I think. I mean, the, you know, to begin your foundation in the music industry right now, um, you know, you can do everything yourself now. You know, you can write, record, produce, market. Um, it's an exciting time, I think, for independent artists. Okay. W what are the tools that, that make it exciting? Or, or you know, you say that you, they can do all those things. W w what is it that... Um well, I mean, for so social media, for one, I mean, you have like a direct, you know, to fan, you know, contact now. So, you know, through all the social networks. And then, um, you know, with home recording and stuff, you can put out your own music, record it at home. Um, there's multiple ways to distribute now through all the, you know, distributors that are available to independent artists. Um, and then you can even, you know, start to grow your own business and become an LLC and and uh, make money from royalties and selling online as well as the shows. <laughs> OK. All right. You know, K Kathleen, I, you know, I think it's fair to say that we've been going through a radical revolution in the music business for over, like, I guess the last 15 years, and it doesn't seem to be subsiding. And today the artist has so much more power as you, you know, just, you know, indicated, and they have more control over their art than ever before. But there often seems to be a huge gap between this reality and the knowledge that artists need to harness and control uh, their music and career. And I'm curious, Absolutely. yeah, as someone who's on the front lines of, you know, marketing music and recording artists today, what are the biggest mistakes you see artists making when they start to market their music today? Well, for one, not being signed up appropriately with like a, the, the PRO as a publisher and as a songwriter. A lot of artists don't know that they are their own publisher. They are self-published and there's royalties that can be collected. So a lot of artists aren't aware of that. Um, they're not aware how to collect their mechanical royalties. And uh, those are things that, you know, artists need help with and some guidance. And it comes down to metadata <laughs> when, when you're in the digital world now. Okay. So, um, you know, that's a big, you know, thing that's left out that a lot of artists just aren't aware of. Can you talk about the importance of the metadata when they're creating their recordings or putting their recordings together? Because I know that that's a real crucial element in terms of... Um, Even with music supervisors, yeah, they're yeah. always harping on the metadata. The metadata, yeah. Can you talk about yeah. that? So metadata is pretty broad, um, and there's all different ways to find metadata, and it's all the metadata is not in one location. Um, it's in the recording of the song. It's where you distributed the song. It's how you registered it with a pro. Um, and it's, you know, ISRC codes, it's UPC codes, it's ISWC codes, <laughs> and it's where to locate those and how to compile it. And um, with, when you're talking about music supervisors, you know, it comes down to clearances. And, uh, you know, most music supervisors that I've worked with um, look to the pro accounts of the artist to double check that they're cleared to license music. So, um, you know, that's really important is to have all your ducks in a row per se with your, you know, registrations, your metadata, um, to license, but to also collect royalties. Yeah. And, and you're alluding to that with my next question. Is there a specific set or checklist of agencies that artists need to be aware of to ensure that they maximize all of the revenue due to them? I know you kind of touched on yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's what we do for artists at Code 3 is we really, you know, have a process that we put in order. And it's, you know, one number one, register with a pro as an artist and a, as a publisher. And uh, make sure your songs are registered with Nielsen SoundScan. And make sure you're registered with Music Reports, Harry Fox, Sound Exchange, uh, the ARC, which is the Alliance of Artists and Recording Companies, which a lot of people aren't aware of. So, um, you know, those things, I mean, TiVo, All Music, you can actually submit metadata to now. So you come up in uh, like on the Spotify uh, about section. So all those things are steps you need to take. And it comes down to spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. 
definitely. Spreadsheets in terms of keeping track of all of the uh, administrative the, stuff, administrative it, yeah. aspects of yeah. it. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And each agency requires a different set of spreadsheets um, and, you know, in Benedetta and their, their specific order. So it's knowing what the agency requires and then actually, you know, executing that spreadsheet and uh, plugging in the gaps. And, you know, essentially what you're doing is throwing a big net over, you know, all your royalties out there and trying to catch them all. OK. You know, for, for, for new, you know, you deal with a lot of new and emerging artists today. And, and I'm curious, Kathleen, if can you talk about how important today, as opposed to, you know, perhaps when you started in the business, how important an artist's personal narrative is when developing their marketing plans? You know, their 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 own personal narrative in terms of getting that across. Uh, and you mean like their brand? Yeah. Sim- okay. similar, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of artists aren't, aren't really aware of that when they're just getting started, that they are a brand and uh, how to how they want to represent themselves and their music. So, you know, that's something that that's a development thing, um, I would say, you know, not sure exactly how you want to present that and present it cohesively across, you know, sh- live shows, um, the digital world. Um, so, you know, it's 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 a trial and error, really. <laughs> Um, but for some guidance, you know, it's basically talking to artists and telling them what we've learned and what other people have experienced based on our knowledge. Absolutely. And let me ask you, Kathleen, getting back to a previous question that I asked you, but for social uh, media needs, is there a specific set or checklist of content needs that artists need to be aware of, you know, with social media and content creation? For social media, I mean, it's consistency. And, and that's that's really what I would tell, I tell artists is, you know, post once a day, post something, you know, that's about your music, post your lyrics, um, post something that's interesting to you that your fans would find interesting, you know. Uh, but more or less, it's about consistency. It's letting, you know, your audience know that you're here and this is what you're doing. And you know, that'll just grow your fan base because people are interested. If they're interested in your music, they'll be interested in your brand and, you know, who you are and what you're doing. You know, Kathleen, you you in your work must deal with a lot of different types of social media platforms. And I, I'm curious from your experience, is it important today to understand the unique strengths and culture of the social media platform that artists choose to use when they're going to market their music? Do you think that's an important factor? Well, and that's always going to change. I mean, we went from MySpace to Facebook and town out to Twitter to where now <clears throat> most people are on Instagram. And uh, so Instagram, you know, you can really harness that. And when you post something, you can post to Facebook and Twitter at the same time. So, you know, utilizing Instagram right now, it seems to be, you know, that's that's putting your finger on the pulse of, you know, where people are looking. So YouTube. <laughs> you know, I, I, you mention all of these, but yet I'm sure you'd agree they're not all the same audience. You know, each one of these platforms must have, you know, distinct features or distinct audiences to them. I guess, you know, Facebook's audience is totally different than Instagram's audience, wouldn't it be? Absolutely. Um, you know, you got to be on all of them and uh, you have to, but consistently update them is is the key, I think. Okay. Um, you can't just abandon one platform versus another. Um, you know, Facebook, a lot of people like to post their shows and, you know, when they're playing, where they're playing, that sort of thing. Instagram is more like pictures of your shows, um, or to, you know, also promote, but, um, you know, another key, I think area is, you know, music videos on YouTube and, uh, Vivo. Yeah. I guess the question was, I guess, you know, I guess not all social platforms are for all artists that, you know, you were mentioning that they should be on all of, I mean, is that something you feel strongly about that all the, uh, Uh, artists or bands or acts need to be on every platform or there's some that speak more to them than others? I mean, it it depends on your audience. Where's your audience? You know, where are your fans? Um, So I guess that is kind of more or less, you know, artist, you know, it depends on the artist and uh, where your fans are. Um, So it's kind of hard to just put every, like all our eggs in one basket. Right. Yeah. You want to diversify is what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Insiders, we hope that you're enjoying our featured interview. Before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. So, hey, Rich, tell me a little bit about the Music Business Registry. Well, what we are, Music Business Registry is the leading contact directory. We publish all of the most current, accurate, and up-to-date contact information for the music industry. We do directories for A&R. We do directories for music publishers. 
We do directories for film and television music. We do directories of artist managers, and we do directories of music attorneys. And we also sell other uh, publications too, like the Indie Bible Series, the YouTube Bible Series, the Indie Spotify Bible Series, and other things as well. That's what we're about. So if I wanted to find out, let's say, the music supervisor for American Horror Story, I can kind of go into the film and TV uh, monthly and find the information that I need there? Well, we don't list specific shows. What we do list is if you know who the music supervisor is, and you can find that out on IMDb, then you can find their contact information. Uh, And we have that in our film and television music uh, monthly. Absolutely. Yes. That's great. And I hear that we have a a discount right now. If you go to musicregistry.com and use coupon code, Code Mubu TV 10 at checkout, you'll receive 10% off your first order. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, we offer that to all of the uh, Mubu TV insiders. So, insiders, check out musicregistry.com and use Mubu TV 10 as your coupon code. Let me ask you there's been a lot of talk uh, around providing context to an artist uh, music today, especially when it comes to the idea of pitching it for licensing. Uh, can you speak to this? Well, everybody wants to license their music. <laughs> right. And and that's great. And um, But when we talk to, you know, artists just starting out, they're just not ready to license their music. Um, and what I mean by that is some of them, you know, some artists aren't registered even with a PRL, a performing rights organization. And really, you have to start there uh, because in order to get the license, you know, the music supervisors to protect themselves in their project have to make sure that they are clearing it correctly with the owner of the music. And And if you're not set up already, you know, legitimately, you know, with an agency, then, you know, chances are they might, you know, get a little nervous and not want to go and pursue that. That makes sense. Okay. Is there a sense that you get when you're licensing music that they want to know the story or the background of the artist? I mean, rather than just or is it just strictly oriented toward the song when you're dealing with music supervisors? Well, you know, when we're pitching to music supervisors, we definitely include highlights. For example, we work with artist Jimmy Sweet. He's out of L.A. and he sold out the Hard Rock Cafe in London. So when we pitch his music, you know, that's something we introduce to the music supervisors to let them know that, you know, this is an artist that is, you know, professional and, you you know, is, you know, pursuing his music career and he's being and he's successful at. It. So this is possibly a song that not only might fit your project, but, you know, an artist that would be supportive of the project and, you know, assist with, you know, getting the word out about your project, you know? Okay. You know, um, we've sort of gotten into the specific area of, you know, one of the services that your company provides, which is the idea of, you know, licensing music or taking your client's music and licensing it into film and television placement. Can you talk about that service and how it works for your clients? Sure. So, I mean, before we even pitch artists music for sync opportunities, like I said, we go right back to the beginning and is, are you registered correctly? Do you own your music? Um, you know, has, have you ever, you know, licensed your music to a publisher already? So, you know, it's making sure the clearances are in place before we go ahead and pitch. Because once you go ahead and pitch, you know, you want to be able to execute, you know, you know, speed Quickly counts and sync. Because yeah. if someone needs a Exactly. So, you know, if, you know, music supervisor, and this happens all the time, they, they say, you know, we need this within 24 hours. Can you clear it? So, you know, in, it's having the clearances in place are key. Um, you know, and then, the, but when you're talking to music supervisors, they have, you know, very specific, uh, you know, things that they have in mind for their project. And, you know, not all songs fit criteria that, you know, they require. So it's about, you know, finding music that we have in our catalog and, getting it to the music supervisor in a timely fashion. Um, if we don't have anything, then we don't submit because we don't want to waste anybody's time. You right. know, music supervisors can be very specific with, you know, we need to like an, an Americana folk song. You know, we don't want to send them hip hop. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cause your <laughs> credibility like gets so, destroyed right there. You know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, clearances first and then it's, Absolutely. And, and you don't want to do that. You know, it, time is time is, you know, of the essence. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's clearances first. Once we know we are cleared with an artist and we got all those decks in a row, then we look for opportunities. And, you know, with the network of music supervisors we've worked with, you know, we, we um, ask them what they're working on, what they need and uh, tell them we already have it pre-cleared and ready to go. So uh, a lot of music supervisors like to hear that first. If you have 200 percent clearance, they're 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 interested and the reason it's 200 percent just for our audience is so you can clear the recording and you can clear the 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 song which is the music and the lyrics uh underneath correct yes 
What are some of the trends you notice about music clearance today or about, you know, song placement? Are there any kind of trends that you're seeing over the last year? Any kind of, you know, musical uh, styles that are becoming more dominant than others? Or is it just, you know, depending on the project? And I ask this of you, Kathleen, because the volume of television shows and the volume of content that's being created over the last year has, you know, literally doubled uh, in the last three or four years than it was, you know, in the past. So have you seen any kinds of trends uh, that have emerged for you? I wouldn't say it would be any specific genre per se. I mean, it's project dependent, but definitely the, the, the field has opened up greatly and especially for independent artists, because, you know, you know, everybody's got a budget that they have to work with. And, you know, and not saying that, you know, the independent artists get paid significantly less because that's not always the case. But I mean, when you're, you're a new artist and you have an opportunity to get a license, you know, chances are you might not be making like, you know, a huge sum of money. But um, the trend I would think would be that there's more availability to license like you said because there's you know all these outlets for projects now you know netflix hulu they're all making their own um you know movies television shows you know that sort of thing i mean even like youtube content is is you know youtube content creators are looking for music for their projects so the 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 door is wide open for licensing but as as far as like a genre i wouldn't say that there's anything specific no because you know we've gotten requests for like i just said americana into you know northern mississippi hip-hop like (laughs) it can really um it's going to keep growing and uh the outlets are going to keep growing because you know the services now are pretty much a la carte you know for these networks so, you know, there's going to be more and more series, more and more movies, and a lot of it's independent. But I think it's really budget, you know, comes into play and independent artists can fit their budget. And as long as the clearances are in place, you have a very good chance of securing a license. Are, are you seeing any kinds of trends uh, as far as uh, content or types of, you know, people that are producing? I mean, are there more independent projects or are there more streaming projects or are there more network projects or more, you know, commercials uh, that are coming to you? What's, what are you seeing on the horizon in terms of, you know, being on the front lines with this? Uh, it's all of the above, honestly. Um, that's, it's the truth because, you know, you got all kinds of content creators out there now. And music, it ties right into, you know, the the images that they're putting out there. So I can't say it's, you know, you know, it's maybe not blockbuster films, you know, uh, but OK, definitely independent films for sure. We're seeing a lot more of that action, um, especially with all the independent film festivals now right. that are, you know, out there. So, yeah, indie film. And uh, really just that we had an indie artist placed a couple months ago that aired at South by Southwest. So that's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny you mentioned blockbusters. I Most of the big tentpole blockbusters like the Avengers and those kinds of movies and, and the they're not music oriented films. They don't have a lot of songs in them, period. I mean, they have an orchestra score, but pretty much that's, I mean, there's not many licensing opportunities, whether you're, you know, a big artist or not. I mean, it's not like they're filled with, you know, with lots of, uh, true. of, of, of songs. True. So, yeah. So, so it is interesting uh, in that to regard. be more involved with a series. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Is, is much more, uh, much more uh, the case these days. When you're working with a new band or artist that you're planning to take on at Code 3, um, how do you determine or identify who their audience is? And, you know, I ask this question uh, because a lot of our audience, you know, it's one of the key things that I think they get stuck on is trying to identify who their audience is. And, you know, maybe you can go into that a little bit more. That's a tough question uh, for me, honestly. I work. We work with artists in a different way than I think. You know, we're not a traditional record label. Okay. Um, you know, we're really artist services. So right. artists already come to us that are basically have a vision um, already of who they are. They do. Right. They already they believe in themselves. They believe in their material, and they're ready to take it to another level. So a lot of them are already pretty much confident. In what they're doing, I mean, they bounce things off of us, which, you know, always happy to help with that. But more or less, you know, we focus on the business aspect of the music for the artist. 
So as far as them going out and building a fan base and that sort of thing, um, that's not, you know, we support them, you know, with our social media posts and our Spotify playlists and uh, putting that out there to the masses. But, um, you know, as far as them building their own, you know, a lot of the artists that we work with are just going, you know, playing shows and uh, creating video content to put out there on the Right. They're already, yeah, they're already active in their own right. So you're just kind of coming in there and trying to scale it for them. Exactly. Yeah. And let me ask you, would you have any advice you personally, as far as, you know, uh, a band or artist trying to identify who their, you know, audience is? Well, I honestly couldn't really say, I mean, because each artist that we have, we don't, are all different genres. So, I mean, you know, we got from punk artists that will go play the punk scene, you know, at the, the, clubs downtown and then you have the singer songwriter jazz quartets that play in coffee shops so but you know release music through you know the plas- the platforms the digital platforms and you know try to maybe even get their cd into starbucks or something you know um but i guess it just comes down to genre specific uh, as to where you're going to find your your base okay yeah i mean i guess it just you know comes down with with regards to the right collaborations and and partnerships uh in an artist's career do you ever offer uh, artists that kind of advice on on the partnerships or the collaborations that you feel might be appropriate for them or that you know you could turn them on to uh in terms of your work partnerships meaning i'm not really following their part well, partnerships in terms of like like what you were saying with like you know a Starbucks or or something like that. Uh, oh, sure, in those, brands. Yeah, um, yeah. Actually, yeah, we've actually done that quite a few times. Um, uh, artists have made videos and uh, used a product in the video, and we have reached out to the brands um, directly to see if maybe the brand would want to get involved with the video and uh, help market and promote. You know. Um, We have not had any brands that have actually executed, you know, that, but um, that was definitely something we were actually over the last six months looking into. And uh, what what we learned from that experience with the brands is basically if it's already done and it's already out there, uh, the brands aren't really interested because they feel that it's actually just a fan made video um, of their product. So I suppose if you were looking for some sort of brand endorsement, you know, as an artist, it's something before you would release it into the public domain, you would want to, you know, get in touch with the brand. Oh, so it's something that they would have to do beforehand, reaching out to the brand as opposed to putting it out. Interesting. And okay. Yes, for sure. Because we had one artist that was interested in doing like a beef jerky (laughs) partnership. I was like, okay, your music fits beef jerky. Sounds good. Okay. (laughs) I mean, you never know. Um, But uh you know, and then we had an artist that put like, um, did a, they uh, rented some fancy cars, you know, and put the fancy cars in the video, but they put like a Maserati with a Porsche and Porsche and Maserati said, no, 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 we're not going to do that because you have other brands in your video. You right. know, if you would have just put Porsche in there, then maybe we would have talked. Um, but that video was also released through the public domain. So already, so um, interesting. they weren't really So interested. I guess a tip to artists before you're reaching out to brands, maybe hold off on releasing the content and then reach out to them and go from there. Definitely. Okay. Um, Kathleen, I, I guess I, I want to ask you a, a personal professional question, which is what have your biggest professional mistakes taught you? Get back up and try again. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, trial and error is just the way it goes. Um, but, uh, you know, you just keep pushing forward and finding ways around things. Um, but that's always been the case, you know, with me personally. Um, I don't mind figuring out that something didn't work and trying another route, um, which is essentially what we just did with the brands, you know, with artists. You know, okay, so we have this video and we have these products in there, but the brands don't want that. So, okay, so now we know. I'm um, just learning from your mistakes and getting back up and trying another route. Okay. All right. Let me ask you, Kathleen, throughout your career, um, are there any specific books or movies or any kind of other media that you have found to be particularly inspiring that you would recommend uh, artists, you know, should be reading or watching to educate themselves? I, I look to Digital Music News a lot, um, digitalmusicnews.com, uh, to see what they're putting out. Uh, Rich Esra, I've looked, I've looked to you over the years, for <laughs> oh, sure, I no you. doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. Um uh, you know, really, it's, you know, getting information from everywhere, you know, books, 
you know, blogs, uh, aerial publicity. Uh, I think she's cyber PR now. Yeah, I've looked I to her really for advice yeah. uh, over the years and she's amazing. She's got a wealth of knowledge. Derek Sivers, you know, when he started with CD Baby, I was, you know, following him very closely. So, you know, it's learning, it's seeing what those folks are saying that have been at this for a while and just listening and, you know, putting, connecting the dots. <laughs> sure. For, for, for someone who is committed to having a career, you know, like your own in music marketing and in helping artists, what advice would you have for them to get started? Definitely hire a marketer, a knowledgeable marketer, um, someone that has experience that's done it before um, because it's its own beast marketing your music, uh, you know, from getting it to radio to get it in, into, you know, music reviews and, you know, a, a hired, well-trained marketer could really help you navigate uh, as opposed to doing that yourself. Um, Cause the time alone you spend on just trying to uh, get the word out there is difficult. And plus always having a third party speak on your behalf is very beneficial. For artists looking to have a career in music, what advice do you have for them? Do it yourself to begin with, you know, and what I mean by that is get yourself set up correctly, you know, get your music protected and, you know, get it copyrighted and take it seriously. And, you know, and that's being organized and getting the business end together, because if you want to make money with your music, you need to make sure that you're collecting everything you can, um, and you want to make money while you sleep. So it's, you know, once your music's out there in the digital world, there's ways to do that. And if you get it set up from the beginning, when you're just first starting out, and I haven't met a musician that told me they're not going to make any more music. So if you get it set up correctly to begin with, then you're just going to build on that foundation and it will just keep growing and growing and growing. You know, for, for our audience, Kathleen, can you can you tell us where people can best connect with you and your company if they're interested in working with you? Oh, sure. Code3records.com. Um, and there's contact forms right through our website. And uh, we're also on the social networks. A lot of a lot of bands and artists contact us through our Instagram direct messaging. Okay, so your Code Three Records on Instagram. Yep, and uh, our website, which is Code Three Records dot com. You got it. Okay. All right. Wonderful, Kathleen. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. We really, really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Some really good practical advice for artists, you know, especially on some fundamental stuff, you know, Eric, yeah. I loved, you know, the way she was talking about some of the biggest mistakes. And this was very interesting to me because these are not necessarily mistakes that only amateur or starting out artists make. I have heard about chart topping chart artists who make these it. same mistakes, like not being signed up with a PRO, right. not having their songs registered with, with, you know, with the publisher or the publisher, whoever it is not taking care of the metadata. Metadata is, is one of the crucial. most important things. If you don't know what it is, learn why, because it's the method in which you are going to be paid as a songwriter, as a recording artist and to be discovered. On exactly. There. You must have that. That's absolutely crucial. Um, you know, it's important in identifying the song. It's important in identifying who the you authors. are. Authors, authors, percentages, the breakdowns, Correct. it's all available. And if you don't have that, you are going to be very, very, very regretful. And for those in our audience that don't understand the term PRO, that's for Performance Rights Organization, and that's ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, which are the three in our country. Right. Um, and so very important, just in case if you guys don't understand that. And, uh, you know, I thought the other one, too, was about collecting their mechanicals and about how that's so important being signed up to the PROs in yes. order to get your, your public performance royalties. And so very, very important stuff to everyone listening. Absolutely. And, you know, and she also talked about some of the unique strengths um, of, uh, you know, of the social media platform when we were talking about that. And I thought that was interesting, you know understanding where are your fans. Yeah. That's where you determine, you know, I, I, I've never been of the belief that you have to be on all, you know, seven or eight social media platforms. And the reason I don't believe that that's necessarily true is because I think you need to do some, some research as an artist 
or as a band in terms of determining where is your audience? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? Are they on Twitter? Where are they? Right. And what platform are you going to use to most effectively communicate with them? Yeah. And another thing that I wouldn't have said in the past, only because we started when we started our journey on the social media um, path with everything, um, you know, we started on three that we knew that I kind of just knew instinctively. But typically now what I've heard and, and read about, and I think it is a more smarter way to go, is to have a plan. Let's say you do want to be like in our case with our band, we're on, you know, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We started on all three of those in advance, but now, and it it seems to be more logical is to become big on one platform and build that one and really understand that one first and then start building your other ones outward instead of being overwhelmed and, you know, particularly for people that don't have a grasp of social media and what it is, I think a good rule of thumb would be, okay, you guys know you're going to be on X platforms. That's what you guys think. Okay, start with one and build that one and learn that platform really well. Learn the intricacies, the ins and outs of it. Once you master that and you've got an audience, then make an announcement. Hey, we're going to Instagram. We're, we're starting our Instagram and then start building that from there. Absolutely. I think that's great advice and really do a deep dive on you know, what platform works for you. And you can answer that by understanding what platform your audience, audience is, is in. Yeah. Really I think once you determine that, that, then you're on your way. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I thought was really interesting uh, that, that she talked about is the, the idea of determining who the audience is, you know, that comes down to demographics and what there, there's a term in the business called psychographics. psychographics yeah. And this becomes very important when you are doing social media marketing, Absolutely, where you can get into things like what are psychographics? Well, demographics are, you know, the age and the, the, the education level levels and, and where people are. Psychographics are more of the finite it's things. Deter- it's determining who your avatar is. Exactly. Are they educated? Are they rural people? Are they city people? Are they people that have, you know, gone to college? Are they people that have not gone to college? What are their beliefs? What are their political, what are their political affiliations? I mean, it's getting down to all of that. Exactly. Are they married? Are they single? How old are they? Right. What's the um, place that they live? Are they, you know, church going? Are they not? Values. All of that gets into, you know, being able to identify. And you can do that today in a very, very interesting way. We can really break down the finite elements of social media. So that's why you need to have an understanding of that stuff. Yeah. And also I find, uh, you know, I found that uh, in terms of her talking about, you know, finding the right collaborations and relationships with brands. And I thought this was a a good one. You know, uh, you know, she talked about some of the mistakes that some of the bands that she was working with made where they had made a video and they had put product in the video and then they they th- again, it wasn't through their fault. It was just they just tried it that way. And uh, I believe they had some product placement in the video and then they went to reach out to the actual brands. And then the brand said, well, you guys have already done it. It's already out there. So we have really no interest if you've already done it. And I think she talked about a really good point where I guess one of their videos, I don't know if it was a hip hop act or something, but that had like a, Fer- a Ferrari and a Lamborghini in the video. And, you know, I think the brands they came back to him and said, "Well, we would have been interested if it would have been Porsche." I think is what she talked Porsche about. Porsche and Lamborghini, and Lamborghini. Were in both of the video, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, we may we may have been you know interested if it was just Porsche, but you guys ended up mixing the brand, so we really don't have any interest. And plus, it's already out there. So I guess one of the two big things that we came off of that and what she determined was. You know, if you do have a piece of product or a thing that you're getting ready to put out, a piece of content that does have a placement, maybe reaching out before you release that to the public and trying to see if there is an interest to get involved. And also on a deeper level, is there the right fit? Exactly. you got to be authentic with that. You know, nothing can hurt a career. Uh, And there are subtler you know, subtle nuances to this world. Um, if, if, if you're, if you're interested in this particular subject, there's a great, great, I, th- I think it's like the, um, and we want to get him on the show. Um, brilliant book, uh, that Steve, oh God, why is he, I'm blanking on his name. Steve, um, 
It's called the Tanning of America. Right. Um, Steve Stout. Steve Stout. Wrote, Steve Stout. Steve Stout yeah. wrote that book, and you need to read that book. That goes into this whole question about brands tying up, and he goes into the real nuances of of all of this. You know, he was the guy who put Jay Z together, I think, with with or with Nike, right. um, putting all of these major major acts and brands together, and he understands those kinds of nuances. I mean, I think of like you know, uh, Kid Rock. And Kid Rock did something that you normally don't do in music, which is he tied up with an alcohol company. Right. But it made total sense because he tied up with Jack Daniels because it worked. His it worked because his audience right. is a natural fit, fit for that. For it. That they're not going to look at it and go, "Oh my God, right. Kid Rock is tying." Up. Oh, that's like a real turnoff, you know. As a, if like Justin Timberlake or somebody did that, that would be like it's just not right. So. Making sure that the thing you're tying in with... It's a market to brand match. Exactly. And a market to audience. Right. Don't do something that your audience is not going to support. Hey, insiders. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra, and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Kabotoglu, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast.